Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. It's good to see everyone here. So just a couple quick announcements. I think we probably have the gist of uh, our announcements at this point in time. I probably could just hand the uh, mic around and you guys could do them for me. What do you think? All right. <clears throat> so I always have one question because I love this question. Who has been here every night so far? Hey, Amen. That is fantastic. Don't forget, we've got a special gift for you, and we've only got one night left, so don't miss out on Friday night. Everybody have their folder with them? Very good. And, of course, we have the Bible School in the back, along with the resource table. Please feel free to take advantage of those. And uh, tonight's free tract for you to give away is a tract called The Living Water. This tract talks about... Jesus and the purity of his truth and what he gives to us. So grab these. You've heard me say it before, but after you swipe your credit card at the gas station, slide it up in there. Then when the next person has to swipe their card, they got to take it and put their credit card in. <clears throat> we will also tonight be taking up an unlock uh, offering. So if you brought anything with you and you can contribute to the unlock offering we greatly would appreciate that and we will put that money back to work for Jesus we also have the DVD order forms if you haven't ordered your DVD for the series yet you can pick those up on the table on your way out so feel free to do that and at this time I'd like to introduce our speaker Pastor Jacob Gibbs good evening How's everybody? Hey Amen. You guys looking good? Five weeks, you have endured the marathon. We have one more session left. That's Friday. And then we have well, actually two more sessions. We have also with Saturday morning, in which we're going to be de dealing with probably the, the most wonderful topic we can end on, and that's called Heaven on Earth. We're looking at Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. It's going to be a beautiful theme. And at this time, we're going to do our gift drawing. And so those of us who are anticipating winning, I hope you do. So what do we have? We have the Great Controversy, which deals with a lot of review, what Pastor Wes has gone over the last three nights. Then we have At Jesus' Feet, talking about Mary and her experience. Who's it going to be? Our winner tonight is Justine Klein. Oh, where is she? We had this question before. She stepped out. Oh, well, if she comes back before. Okay, we gotta. We gotta be here to win. And our second winner is Don Mead. Don Mead. Don Mead. Very good. Which would you like? The Great Controversy or At Jesus' okay. Feet? Great Controversy. Very good. Oh, I think we have our first name here. It's Justine. Come all the way down. There is your book. Congratulations. That's going to be a book report. You have a week to read that book. Or else you preach. At this time, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna do a review after the special music because it's gonna be part of the presentation. So at this time, we're gonna do the special music.
We've covered a lot of territory these last few weeks, haven't we? We've dug deep. I'm trying to find my clicker, so I'm trying to dig deep. And God has just really blessed us. Have you been blessed this week? I feel like the, the lady that lost her coin and she can't find it. I'll find it. It's here somewhere. There it is. Amen. Hey, it went on me. Let's go back it up. And so we want to review a little bit, but before we do, let's pray and really ask God to bless us. I know that if you've come here for my, my wisdom, not very many people would be here. Amen? Why are we here? To learn about God's wisdom. And so we need to seek God together. Let's pray. Father, we just are very thankful that you have sent the best teacher, and it's not Jacob Gibbs. It's the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit is who's, who's the one that guides us into truth. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that testifies of your Son. And we want that testimony in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would lead and guide us and motivate us and just woo us by your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think the longer that I'm following Christ, the more I like him. The more I, I just realize that he is, he is awesome. Have you guys found that to be true? The more you follow Christ, the richer he gets. And I love it that he never stops the learning process. There's always new things we can gain. I love that about him. And you know, I believe when we're in eternity, we won't exhaust the cross. The theme of the cross will be ceaseless through all of eternity. And after a thousand years, we're going to be like, Jesus will preach a sermon and we'll learn something new. 
Isn't that awesome? So, so I believe today we can always gain something, gain a closer walk with Jesus. And so there's two more in phase one of the Unlocked pre presentations. There's, to, there's Friday evening and Saturday morning. And then Unlock Revelation concert this Sabbath evening. It starts at 6.45. I heard some of the practice last night. Absolutely lovely. And then phase two begins. We have Sabbath school. It's like, it's like what maybe many of you know as Sunday school. It starts here before service begins. And it starts around 9.15. And we'll be meeting here for a special class. Then Wednesday evenings at 7. And then... Also, I would make my schedule available to any of you who would like to do personal Bible studies. And then you can ask any question, and I'll try to give you a Bible answer. But some questions will be hard, and I'll have to go back to my, my study and research it, because I don't have all the answers. My, my, one of my favorite friends in the UP, he says, I have all the answers. I just don't know what questions they go with. That's a fun way of saying, I don't know everything. And so that's just something for you guys to realize that we don't want this motivation to learn about Revelation and get close to Jesus to end. We could just say, oh, after Saturday, oh, we're done. And then, but there's, you guys still have a journey. We want to continue that journey with you. Amen? I love people. That's why I'd be, I'd be more than willing to make my schedule available to do studies. When I, was, when I began in the Christian journey, I met a guy in Gaston, Oregon. It's a small little town. And he had, a, he had a family and he was really busy. So the only time he could study the Bible was at 5 in the morning. So I woke up at 4, got ready, and I went over there and studied at 5 in the morning. So if you want to study at 5 in the morning, if that's the only time that works for you, I'll make it work for me. And some of you are, I'm going to test him. I'm going to test the brother. So let's do a little bit of review. We're going to track over the last five weeks, okay? We're going to do it. So we kind of started with realizing that there's signs of the times. We're living when Jesus is coming back. Then we studied Daniel 2, which really, really puts that to perspective. We see the foundation and prophecy of Daniel and Revelation. This is like the parade of nations. And this, this also helps us realize where we are in the times. Judgment is now. We went through that theme. We realize that judgment is taking place right now. And if you think about it, in every part of the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood, and you can go to all these different, there's always an investigative judgment that takes place before it's executed. And so God did it repeatedly in the many stories of the Bible. And so he's just following his pattern in the big conclusion the Antichrist revealed. We went through two nights about that. I think a lot of people were pretty like, wow, but it makes sense. The devil's delusions are going to be very close to the real thing because he's, his job is to deceive. So we can't expect him coming in red tights and horns. That's, I mean, he wants everyone to believe that's what he looks like, but he was, a, he was an angel. And so he knows how to look godly. And then we, took, we look at how the, the Antichrist made an attack on the law on the Sabbath. And Pastor Pepper has really showed that quite extensively. And then we studied the second coming. And we realized that there's a great counterfeit and that it's this, the idea of the secret rapture. Did you know where the secret rapture, how it came about? I'm going to take a few minutes just to explain. During the Reformation, when Luther was preaching, and he was calling out the state church at the time, there was a lot of people that left that church, and that's kind of where the Lutheran movement formed. And then the state church, they, they had to do something. And so they came up with two schools of thought in Revelation. The first school of thought was, Preterism. Have you ever heard of the term preterism before? And then the second school of thought, this was developed by a Jesuit priest in the 1500s, was futurism. And so what these, they're, they're kind of extremes. 
preterism believes, because people are pointing to them and saying, you're the Antichrist. And they say, no, 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 no. We're, preterism says that the Antichrist was fulfilled in the first century. All of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century. So we can't be the Antichrist because that's already done and passed. That's preterism. That was very successful as a counter-reformation in the 1500s. But then over time, that lost steam. And futurism, which was created by a Jesuit priest, in the 1800s, that really took on steam. And this is the idea of, of the secret rapture. And the reason why, it's, that, why it was invented is because it's saying we can't be the Antichrist because the Antichrist is not revealed yet. It's going to be revealed way in the future during that seven-year time of, of tribulation. It was very clever because it takes, it takes the, what the Reformation was doing and it deflects it to another time. But for some reason, Protestants today, they will, they will practically, if you don't believe in the seven-year tribulation and the secret rapture, they'll cast you out and they'll say, oh, you're, you're not good. But if you dig d deep enough, you realize, wait a second, where does it come from? It was invented to deflect people from the truth. And if you have questions about the secret rapture, I'd be more than happy to explain. I only can explain how I see the scriptures, but I think it's pretty clear. I'd be more than happy to show you how I see the scriptures. I believe that's truth. And so we went over that a couple, a couple weeks ago. Then we talked about the truth about death. What does Jesus call death? He says, Sleep. That's how Jesus describes what happens when you, when you die. Then we talked about the truth about hell. Many people believe that hell is an everlasting burning place. I think a lot of people get their theology from the cartoons and from Greek mythology. But when you read it in Scripture, you don't, you don't see that. It's not you don't see that consistent teaching. You see a destruction of the wicked. You don't see an everlasting destroying of the wicked. You don't see that in Scripture. Yes, we covered it. There's some... There's some ideas that talks about forever and ever. But when you use that forever and ever, it's always about just until it's finished. And then we talked about the millennium, thousand years after the second coming. We talked about USA and Bible prophecy. That was pretty fascinating in Revelation 13. Then we looked at the mark of the beast. We looked at God's health plan. We looked at the last few sessions on does God have a remnant church? And today we're going to be looking at Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to be looking here, but let's, let's, I read this a while ago in the first week, fourth night. This is talking about the Antichrist power, the little horn, the same one in Daniel 7. I believe it's talking about that, that church power that, ran, that, that was in existence for 1260 years, and then it had a mortal wound. It says, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn, the Antichrist, to oppose the daily sacrifices, the ministry of Jesus. It was trying to deflect the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is all about forgiveness of sins. This power says you need to go to a priest for forgiveness of sins. And then it says, and he cast truth down to the ground. And so if you looked at any of those points of review, and you, and you realize that you believe most of that all your life, it's because the system for the last 1,500 years has been diluting truth. No one likes diluted orange juice. We shouldn't like diluted truth either. And it says he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. God says he's prospered dur during this time that he ruined truth. This next verse in 2 Thessalonians talking about the Antichrist power, we're going to go to verse 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one. Many scholars agree that this is like the, this is the Antichrist power. This is the little horn power. It's the same power. It says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive, what? The love of the truth, that they might be saved. So we know that the Antichrist has cast truth to the ground and we know that those who don't love truth won't be saved. And so we need to make sure that we know we lift truth up through our 
Bible study and through our lives and that we love it. That we, why do we want to love truth? Because who is truth? Jesus is truth. That's why we want to love truth. We want to love everything that he teaches. Amen? I don't, want to, I don't want to love something that he doesn't teach. I don't want to love something that the Antichrist replaced as truth. I want to love what Jesus says. I want to love these very words. And so, Revelation's renewal. We're going to be looking at Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to pick up at the cross. Jesus was hanging there. And he's dying. He's, he fulfilled all the prophecies concerning him. And he's, and he's there and he says, it is finished. They take him. They take him down Friday night. They laid him in a tomb. His lifeless form. They laid him in a tomb. And they go back and they rest, as the Bible says, on the Sabbath. They go back early Sunday morning and they notice that rock was rolled away and Jesus was resurrected. How many days did Jesus stay on earth after his resurrection? Forty days. Yes. Acts chapter 1 verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so could you imagine that? You, you witnessed his death on the cross and then for 40 days he's living and he's helping and he's teaching and he's doing many wonderful things. 40 days. Could you imagine being a disciple just 41 days from that point and you were doubting. You were in denial. You ran away from Christ. And then, and then he dies. And oh, if only you think. Oh, if only I spent more time listening. I spent more time with the Savior. But then he resurrected. You would make sure that every syllable you were hanging on to, you would make sure every, wherever he was you wanted to be, you would have this intense desire to be with Jesus. Lord, I want that, don't you? Today, don't you want that? And so he's, he's, he's preaching the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We go to Matthew. At the end of the 40 days, this is what he says. Matthew's account, this was Jesus' last words. And he says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I believe, just on a side note, that this series is fulfilling that very thing. It says, baptize people, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And I want to be able to teach the things that are of the Bible, not just because they're popular, but I want to teach and I want to preach the very things that I find in the Bible, even if it cuts against the grain of popular Christian teaching. That's what I want to do. And so when it comes to certain things that most of the churches don't do, and I see it in the Word of God, I need to teach it. I need to preach it because I, I got to follow this verse. And we go back to Acts and being assembled together with them as we're getting the last day and being assembled with them. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father. What's the promise of the Father? It's the Holy Spirit. Promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Do you know how many days they had to wait? They had to wait 10 days after Jesus' ascension. But wait for the promise of the Father. Matthew 3, 11, just, just going back to a prophecy. Indeed, I baptize you, John the Baptist says, with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, 
whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist knew that 50 days after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit was going to come and, and baptize the people. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Most of you know this story quite well. And so what happens to Acts 1.9? Now when he was spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received them out of their sight. I got kind of clever with the graphic here, so buckle up. Ready? It's pretty impressive. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so on that 40th day, Jesus gets taken up and they were to wait where? Jerusalem for 10 days. We know that because Pentecost means it's, it's Pentecost, it's 50. It was 50 days after the resurrection. And then that's when God poured the Holy Spirit down. We know it was waiting 10 days. They were to pray and they were to... You know, they were to think about their heart. They knew something big was going to happen. They're confessing sin. They're making their lives right with God. And they're preparing their hearts for a blessing. We're going to go behind the scenes now. Revelation takes us behind the scenes. Have you ever, have you ever played with a, a studio with a green room like this? Like you can, you can do whatever you want there and you can put anything in the background. But when you watch the movies today, you don't see the green screen, do you? You see all the weird stuff that, you know, whatever movies you're watching. But Revelation is behind the scenes. We're going to go to Revelation 4. I'm going to ask two questions. Who's there and who's not there? It's the throne room. Who's there and who's not there? We're going to go to Revelation 5. And we're going to realize the one, we're going to make a strong conclusion. Revelation scene. After these things... I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. What happened before this? Revelation 2 and 3. John, in a sense, writes a letter to the seven churches on earth. And this is his entrance into the temple of God, to the throne room of God. I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. In a sense, the heavenly sanctuary is open, and he goes in. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Who is that sitting on the throne? Is it Jesus or is it the Father? Let's, we're, we're going to come to a conclusion here. I want you to just keep thinking about that. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance, and there was a, a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. This pause right here, this is a, a marvelous thought. What does a rainbow mean? What, what, is it, what does it mean in the Bible? It's God's promise that he's going to be with us, that he's going to protect us. It's his covenant with us. So when... when God's sitting on the throne, always there's a rainbow around him, and he's always remembering us. I love that. It's a constant reminder of his promise to be with his people. That's an awesome God. Someone can say at least a small amen. amen. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So who's there? We know one sitting on the throne, but we're at a debate. Is it Jesus? Is it the Father? We have 24 elders around. And then it says, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Turn with me to uh, Isaiah 11.2. Remember, I believe the 
book of Revelation always alludes to the Old Testament. Revelation 11, verse 2. Where are we going? Did I say Isaiah? You're, you're as confused as I am. Let's go to Isaiah. 11, 2. Where are we going? Isaiah. 11, 2. I would be a terrible teacher because I give one answer, give the other answer, then I ask a test question. My wife's a teacher. I got to learn from her. Isaiah 11, 2. It says here, are we there? Isaiah 11, 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the Spirit of the Lord. We have seven descriptions of the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. So when it says the seven spirits, just like it says the seven churches, it's talking about the complete church of God. This is talking about the complete Holy Spirit of God. There's seven days in a week. It's the complete picture. And you see a lot of sevens. You see seven trumpets, seven seals, seven plagues, seven horns, seven eyes. You, and so when it says, the, it's not saying that there's seven spirits of God in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense that there's seven different spirits. What it's saying is that there's, it's a complete, perf perfect number. It's the Holy Spirit. So we have, we have a picture of the throne. We have the awesome scene of the throne of God. We have God there. We have the 24 elders, and we have the Holy Spirit. We don't see Jesus in this picture. We don't see Jesus in this picture. That's why we turn to Revelation 5. Where is Jesus? We know Jesus should be there because of Hebrews 8.1. I want to review this verse. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. Why isn't Jesus there in heaven? He should be there, right? He should be there. Because the throne room of God is the sanctuary. So we're going to come to an awesome conclusion. So... Where is Jesus? Revelation 5 gives us the answer. And so, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, I believe that's the Father, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And so there's a, little bit of, there's a little bit of sadness. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Jesus shows up. How does Jesus show up? And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Why wasn't he found in Revelation 4? Because he was on earth, perhaps during those 40 days. He's coming back to heaven. It says, and I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. When it says as though it had been slain, what does that mean? When was the lamb slain? On the cross. He just was slain. And it's a symbol of that. It's not like he's bleeding in heaven. But it's, it's, just, it's just using symbolic language to realize that he just died for humanity. And he's back in heaven. Stood a lamb as though I'd been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so we see the seven spirits of God. When were they sent out to all the earth? At Pentecost. 
Jesus said for those 40 days, he says, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power from heaven. Revelation 4 and 5 helps us understand the throne room setting of what took place at Pentecost. The throne room setting of what happened the 40 days prior to Pentecost. Jesus isn't in heaven because he's with his disciples on earth. We don't see him in Revelation 4, but we see the Holy Spirit. We get to Revelation chapter 5. We see Jesus enters the throne room just having died. And then his first, you know what Pentecost, you know why Pentecost is important? Not because God gave us gifts. That was, that was, a, that, that was, the, that was the cause of the importance or that was the effect of the importance. But the cause of why it was important is because that was the first action when Jesus sat on the throne. His very first action was to send the Holy Spirit to all the world. And so what we see here is God's very, Jesus' very first action as back on the throne, back at the right hand of God. Revelation starts with that picture. I think it's beautiful. It helps us realize that we're not, we're not alone in this. Let's go through a little bit because we see how the Holy Spirit says, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. What does the Holy Spirit do? Let's review. And I'll pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Who was the first helper? Jesus was. And he wanted to give us a second helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells in you. So he is, the, he is the helper. He helps us. Just like Jesus did, but he helps us. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. So he helps us and he brings into remembrance the very teachings of Jesus. He does that. How does the Holy Spirit work? He works through people preaching. He works through you reading the Bible. He works through you associating with, with friends. And God can speak through friends. The Holy Spirit has many avenues to help you. To help you learn. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I shall send to you from the Father... So this was Jesus' first act as King. And he sends us this beautiful gift. The Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And so the Holy Spirit, his main job is to uplift Jesus. He's like a telescope that's looking at Jesus. When you're looking at the telescope, do you see the telescope or do you see what it's pointed at? That's what you see. You see what it's pointed at. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He's, he's as selfless as the other, other ones. He's as selfless as Jesus because he's all about pointing to Jesus. That's his sole work, is the point to Jesus. In 16.8, and this is the work that we don't like, but we need. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. And when there's preaching going on, or when you're reading the Bible, you feel that uncomfortable feeling that you're not living right, that you're not living according to the Word of God, and, and you, you feel like you want to run, you feel like you want to avoid, you feel like you want to uh, uh, you know, move around, you feel like you want to dance around, so you don't have to have the Spirit. Talk to your heart. But the only reason why he wants to talk to your heart is because he wants to lead you to a better place. But for some reason, we don't like that kind of confrontation. We don't like that direct, directness of the Spirit. So we try hard to avoid it. I remember when my brother became a Christian and he started following God's Word and His truth and following Jesus. Whenever he was home, I made sure I was in the other corner. I'd make sure I'd... I'd go out the window and go to my car and drive away because I just didn't want to be around him. It wasn't my brother. It was the Spirit of God. Because I lived with my brother for many years. I didn't care. But when the Spirit of God was in him and he was sharing, the Spirit of God was trying to, trying to witness to me, I was trying to avoid it. And that was the very first act that Jesus gave us as king is helping us realize that we need a Savior. Because Jesus, he only could be at one place at one time, but the Holy Spirit could be all over the place. And he can help you and he can help me. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth. 
for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. That's the job of the Spirit. So when, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's all about helping us see our need of true, heartfelt conversion. See the Savior. I praise God for this first act of Jesus on the throne. I praise God for the story of Revelation 4 and 5 that helps us realize that our greatest need in the world is the Holy Spirit. Because who does the Holy Spirit tell us about? It tells us about Jesus. And we need Jesus more than anything in this world. So another helper, that's who the Holy Spirit is. Like Jesus, he'll always be with you, teaches the things Jesus taught, testifies of Jesus, convicts of sin, guides us into all truth. He's our true guide. That's why we need the Spirit of God. And when you're learning the Bible, you've got to make sure that you're in prayer. And some of these things are new to you. How do you know it's truth? What if it's as Pastor Gibbs and Pastor Pepper's wild ideas? How do you know? We can trust that the Spirit of God will lead you as he leads Wes and I. That the Spirit of God will lead us together. I can trust that. You know, I never wanted to be a pastor. I, I wanted, it was funny, when I was growing up, all I wanted to do was do art for Walt Disney. That was my dream. But God pulled me out of that when I was 19 when I became a Christian, when I made my decision to become a Christian, it wasn't, I thought I had to be a missionary. I didn't know that there was like, there was a kind of like this, this lukewarm section that, that you just accept Jesus and you can get kind of just pew ride for a while. I didn't know that that's what people do. When I accepted Christ, it was all or nothing. I think that's the way it is, isn't it? All or nothing. The Holy Spirit drives us to Jesus, helps us to see our need. At the end of that sermon, Revelation, we went behind the scenes, and the Holy Spirit was sent out to all the, all the world, and they were praying, and they had tongues of fire on their head, and they started speaking in other languages. They started speaking in different languages and they were able to communicate the gospel to all the world because they were trying to tell the action of the first king, that, or not the first king, but Jesus on the throne, his first action. And they're saying that Jesus is in heaven right now as king and they're communicating that in different languages. They're doing it in all sorts of all the languages of Europe and, their, and the languages around. And they were excited and people heard the sermon and they were cut to the heart. And they wanted, they are like, what do we do now? And then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, that gift, its number one concern is the conversion of the soul. That's the gift. That's what it's all about. Do we appreciate that gift? Did that, has that gift stirred in your heart? Has that gift this morning drove you to Jesus? This is a beautiful thing. In John chapter 3, we see the first helper in action. And he's talking to Nicodemus. And he's saying, he's saying, I have the verse up here, Except a man be born again. So Nicodemus, is, he's saying like, oh, you're an amazing teacher. You must come from God. You can do amazing things. And he's kind of like, it seems like he's trying to build up Jesus. He comes at night because he didn't want anyone to see him. And, and he's, Jesus says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again means being born from above, born through the operation of the Holy Spirit. And then Nicodemus gets kind of smart, doesn't he? He's like, huh, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? And so, you know what's interesting? The Holy Spirit was fighting with Nicodemus. 
He was, he was struggling. And when we give a sarcastic answer to a serious question, that's evidence that the Holy Spirit's really racing on your heart. You know, when, 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 we, give a, when we give an action or when we give a comment about avoidance, facing the truth, it means that the Holy Spirit's racing upon your heart. If, we, if we're avoiding the preaching of the Word of God, it's, it's indicating that the Spirit is racing upon your heart. There's two types of, of indicators that the Spirit's working. You can receive the Word of God with joy, or you can receive it with sadness. Because sometimes the Word of God causes us to change, causes us to make a change. You know, Jesus says He brings a sword, and it cuts relationships. And that's hard sometimes. And so we either avoid it because we don't want to cut those relationships. We don't, we don't want to cut those ties. Nicodemus reacts in a sarcastic way. Nicodemus knew better. He, was, he understood the concept of being born again because of baptism and such. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born of water, when you come to Jesus in baptism, that's what that means. Born of the Spirit is when you receive the Holy Spirit at baptism as a gift given you by God. We went through this text yesterday. One Lord, or a couple evenings ago, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I believe when it says one baptism, it's referring to one method of baptism. The way Jesus was baptized. There's many different methods. There's sprinkling and there's pouring. And, and I, I've heard of someone who, who filled a bathtub up of rose petals. and was baptized in rose petals. I don't know if that's very biblical. I, don't, I, I haven't seen that yet. And then a church in North Carolina gathered a whole bunch of people up. And they had a fire truck there. And they turned the water on. And they got everyone soaking wet. And that was like a mass baptism. I don't know if that works. That'd be fun. But I don't know if that would have spiritual significance. Maybe on a summer day we can all gather in the yard and I can, I can spray you with the fire hose. But you can't count that as a baptism. I don't think you can. Well, you could say it, but I don't think it means very much. What, what's the one method of baptism? We look to the example Christ, don't we? Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had ba been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Now, when it says that he came up from the water, it's referring to that he came out of the water. Jesus was immersed into the water. He comes up out of the water. There's, there's amazing spiritual significance to that act. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. This tells us something about baptism. When Jesus was baptized, his heavenly Father couldn't contain His joy and thundered from heaven saying, I am well pleased. Now Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, a meandering ribbon of river that flows 150 miles or so from, and it enters the Dead Sea. It forms part of the border between Jordan and Israel. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River because John the, baptized, John the baptizer was there. Why was He baptizing there? Well, the Bible says in John 3.23, John the Baptist baptized there. There was much water there. That's what it says in John. If he could get away with just sprinkling a few drops of water on a person, he would have taken a container of water and he would have went into the desert and he would have sprinkled it on people. But he wanted to be where there's a lot of water. Now let's press on and see another example. If you remember in Acts 8, there's Philip. 
that Philip was a deacon who was led by the Spirit of God out into the wilderness where he intersected with the Ethiopian man who was an official of the government of Queen Candace. The Bible says that this fellow was reading Scripture. He's reading the book of Isaiah. Then Philip opened his mouth, the Bible says, and began at the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. As they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they went down into the water, and they baptized, and they came out of the water rejoicing. This is, the, this, this is the activity of Jesus on the throne. He sends the Spirit of God. He directs Philip. So Jesus is at the command center. And the Holy Spirit is working with Jesus, and there's amazing conversions taking place. And remember, when Jesus was baptized, his father rejoiced. When the Ethiopian was baptized, he rejoiced. When we decide to follow Jesus, all of heaven rejoices. Because that's what God's all about. He's about reconnecting his lost children to his home. The word, do you know what the word baptize means? It means baptizo. It actually means to immerse or plunge. And so if you were to take some cloth, they used to dye cloth, they would baptize, not to be sacrilegious, they would use the word baptizo, that cloth into the dye, until all the fibers were, were stained with that dye. In baptism, we want to go under the water so that all of our selfishness, all of our old nature can, in a sense, we surrender it all so that we can be filled with God. It's a, it's, it's a symbol. When we read Mark sixteen fifteen, it says here, And he said to them, Go into all the world. This is Mark's account of Jesus' last words. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So there's an inward thing that has to happen. What's the inward thing? Belief. And then the outward is the baptism. What if you get baptized without the inward? It means nothing. There's a, there's a concept. My friend wrote a book. It's baptized but buried alive. And there's an there's a example that I like to use. It's the idea of where the graveyard shift comes from or the dead ringer. People a couple centuries ago would get buried and then for some reason they dug them up again. They noticed when they opened the casket, there's a bunch of claw marks in the casket because they're buried alive. Because uh, their symptoms looked like they're dead, but they buried them. And so they tied, a, fing they tied a, a string to their finger, and they would have a bell above ground, six feet ab above ground. And then the guy in graveyard shift would hear the, the guy, you know, like moving, like he just woke up. And the bell would be ringing. Thank you, I couldn't think of that word. <laughs> and then they would quick dig him up, bring him up. You never want to be buried alive. You never want to be baptized and buried alive. You never want that experience because that means nothing has happened. And so if you've been baptized but buried alive, that's not, that you want to make sure you have a belief. You want to make sure that you have a connection with God. You want to make sure that you surrender to Jesus. So we need, we need the most important thing is the belief. If we really believe that Jesus died, we will. We will. Then the Bible says, Buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. So when Jesus died on the cross and He, would, and he entered that tomb, it's the same thing as when we're lowered into the watery grave of baptism. If if a pastor held someone underwater for like 15 minutes, would that guy be okay? 
No. Why, why does God want us to go underwater in baptism? Because it signifies that we truly believe that Jesus died for us, that we're dying to our old nature, and that we, when we come up out of the water, as Jesus came up out of the grave, we, we believe that that same power is in us through the Holy Spirit, that we can live and be victorious as Christians. So we don't want to be baptized but buried alive. We want to, be, we want to believe and the very reason why we are getting baptized, that Jesus died and he, and he wants us to die to ourselves, so we can live to him. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Same thing. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. This is the beautiful significance of baptism. When we, when we are converted, we're rejoicing at the very first act of Jesus on the throne after the cross because the Holy Spirit has touched our hearts and renewed us. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have no more desires for sin. That's a constant work, and God's constantly working in us. And it's, a, it's the work of sanctification. Then we can say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. In baptism, you receive new direction, new freedom, and a new spiritual power. So if the Bible is so clear on this subject, how, why are there different methods? We can go back to the cathedrals of old where they now do infant baptisms, and you go back and you can see a baptistry where they baptize people by immersion. Here at Faith of Our Fathers, it says, for several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was usually conferred by immersion. But since the 12th century, the practice of baptizing by infusion has prevailed in the Catholic Church as the manner is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. So it would be like more of the sprinkling concept. And so in addition, the church would baptize infants because they believe that Adam's original sin was passed on and so every baby was guilty. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that the father's sins are on the children. And so... The Bible says that we need to repent and be baptized, that we need to believe, and that we need to keep learning. And so, can babies repent? Can they keep learning? No, so the idea of infant baptism doesn't work. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This, the, the main thing here, whenever it comes to the Bible, whenever it comes to new ideas, the main idea is, do you have a heart to surrender to the clear, thus saith the word, or thus saith the Lord? Do we have a heart that's willing to surrender to the simple word of God? The, one of the reasons why we don't want to surrender is because we have so many attachments, so many relationships, and so the very thing that you're struggling with right now, the reason why you don't want to surrender is most likely because you have a, a relationship with something, some habit, some issue, some person, some entity, some body, some group. We don't want to, and, and we feel like God's cause, asking us to, to move on and we just, it's hard to surrender because we don't think we can be happy without it. We don't think we can have joy without it. But surrender is the number one weapon that we can use against sin and selfishness. That's how Jesus lived a victorious life. 
For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27. In Acts 19.5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul, in Acts 19, Paul talked to a group of people who, who were baptized in John's baptism. And Paul answered by saying, John baptized with baptism of repentance, saying that the people should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. That's Acts 19.5. It says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they, they experienced John the Baptist preaching and they were baptized. But then when new truth came, they accepted that new truth and were baptized again. The Bible identifies that when we have an experience with God, we get baptized, but then, then maybe we're just kind of we're just, we're going. But then all of a sudden we realize that God has something new for us. Rebaptism is biblical. It's your expression to God saying, Lord, I love you. I love what you've shown me. I love everything. And then you get baptized by a celebration of joy. And that's why we have invited you for rebaptism. Or baptism. Because it's about a celebration of you realizing that God has a whole lot more for you. And that's awesome. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day, the first act of Jesus on the throne. His first act. One sermon. 3,000 souls were brought to the kingdom of God. Praise God. Praise God. We enter into a sacred relationship with Jesus when we are sealed with him in baptism. Paul talked about the washing of regeneration. And that's what, hap that's what baptism is. It's dying to the old way. It's burying our sins in a watery grave. It's raising up again to walk in newness of life. If the devil ever comes knocking on my door, I can point back to that celebration and say, I'm a child of God. The old me was buried and Jesus lifted me up out of the water. Baptism is a sign of the church and to the world that you have accepted the greatest Redeemer ever. You've made a full surrender. You've chosen to follow him. So if the devil comes knocking, you can say, I got a celebration to remember because I believe in Jesus and I've shown the world that belief. Now sometimes we kind of, baptism like the picture presents is like marriage and God never wanted divorce to happen. He never wants that to happen. But like in a relationship with the Lord, God will never leave us or forsake us. But sometimes we walk away from Him. And we, we, we kind of maybe just go through the motions. It doesn't mean anything. It's dry. It's formal. And then we have a revival. And we, we sense God's calling our heart. We sense Him. And then that's appropriate for rebaptism as well. It's appropriate if you've never had that experience to get baptized. Old Testament story, there was a man in the Bible named Nahum. He was a leper. And the prophet of God told him to dip himself in the Jordan River. He complained a little bit because I guess that river was pretty dirty. Into the water he went, and he went down one time. He went down two, three, four. He went down seven times. And the seventh time he got up, and the leprosy was gone. In the Bible, leprosy is a symbol of sin. If you have sinned, God says, I invite you. Go down to the waters of baptism and you can come up with the assurance that God loves you. God knows that you need him. And, he, and this is the celebration of him needing him. I read in a story recently 
about the California fires. This, this couple woke up and they smelled smoke. They knew it was wood smoke. They smelled it before. They're used to California. They're, they're used to fires. And the smoke was really heavy. And they realized, where is it coming from? And they looked and there's a wall of fire coming at them. And they had no way to go, nowhere to escape, nowhere to go. It, was, it, it already covered the driveway. The only thing they could think about is their neighbor's pool. They ran to the neighbor's pool and they jumped in. It was in October. It was cold. This was only this, this month. And they, they were in the pool for six hours as the firestorm went through and they survived through water. There's a firestorm coming. And we too can be saved through water. Isn't that amazing? God has a, what, the act of baptism is a, is a very significant event. Now, you may be wondering, do you have to be baptized to be saved? Well, if you want to have the thief on the cross's experience. But I don't think you want that real experience. He'll be in the kingdom. But if he survived, I bet you that he would want to get baptized. If you have the chance to get baptized. You can be saved through water. If you have a chance to accept Jesus with your whole heart, and maybe you've, you've realized that there's, there's wonderful things that you've learned this, this week, and you just want to express to Jesus a thank you. We're gonna, I'm just going to have a, a card, and I want you to realize I don't want to put any pressure on you. Okay? This isn't me trying to twist your arm to make a decision because of some emotional story. But if you sense in your heart that God is calling you to a deeper relationship with Him, if you sense that you need to commit to Him through baptism or rebaptism or studying, studying more, this appeals for you. Like I said, I don't want you to feel like there's any kind of pressure on you coming from me. Because it's your walk with the Lord. It's your walk with Jesus. And I just, I'm just giving you a quiet moment to contemplate where am I with Jesus? Where am I with that commitment? So we're going to pass a card down. And it's a simple card. It has four points. And maybe you have questions. You know what we stand for? We stand for Christ. Everything that He taught. If you have any questions concerning anything that we covered, I would encourage you to, like I said, it's my task to study the Bible with people. If you have anything that you want to study about, check it there, then there's a room for a question on the bottom. Number two, I'd like more Bible studies continuing to continue growing in grace. A little spelling error, I apologize, but, but you'll understand what it means. So you want to continue in Bible studies to continue growing in grace. Number three, if you feel like the need that you want to get baptized, you sense that God's been on you and with you and pressing on your heart, you just check, I'd like to get baptized. And maybe you've realized that there's this wonderful thing for you and you've been kind of, kind of just amazed. And you want, to be, you want to be part of this last day movement, this prophetic movement. You'd like to join that body. Rebaptism. If you have any questions concerning what it means to join what I believe is God's movement, you can, you can write that question in the, in the bottom. This is just for you to, if you've already checked that you'd like to be baptized or rebaptized, praise God. Nothing wrong with checking it again. We're going to have Ashley sing for us while we just, just think about the love of Jesus, what he means to you. Prince of peace, come.
control my will bid this struggling heart be still bid my fears and doubting cease hush my spirit into peace thou hast bought me on you for a rebaptism, that doesn't mean your previous experience is obsolete. We praise God for every step of the journey. It's just a celebration for what He wants to bring us. So that's what it means. We don't, we don't cast the past away. We, we just love Jesus for how He guided us. And we celebrate with Him at every turn in every new chapter. We just celebrate with Jesus. And that's what it's all about, is to celebrate with Jesus. And so I just want to thank you for, for coming and, and willing to let Jesus speak to you through the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, you have done an amazing thing through your Son. And we thank Jesus for the act of sending the Holy Ghost that first wonderful act on the throne. We see how it changed the world and how it changes us. We thank you for that very act of revelation's renewal. Thank you for conversion. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the blessed word of God. And Lord, help us cherish the most beautiful thing we can cherish, and that's your son. Help me to surrender, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could pass in your cards to the center so that we can collect them and help minister to you, I'd be very grateful.
had a few announcements. I really tried to finish up before eight. I apologize. See, when, when we are washed in the watery grave, our sins go to the deep. And so Friday is Revelation's end time prophets looking at that wonderful story. And then on, on Saturday, we're looking at heaven on earth. So thank you. You have two more sessions left.